Great. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name, again, is Jeffrey Hull, Senior Director of Talent Development. Uh, with me is Mark Nelson, Regional Director of Employers Group, also on our um, Employers Group's helpline. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome you to the amended Employment and Housing um, uh, Regulations, what has changed with the CFRA. Um, if you were a part of the presentation a few uh, weeks ago, probably over a month ago, we actually conducted a webinar uh, regarding the changes with the AB 1825 requirements. And certainly, if you did not participate in that webinar, we'd be happy to send you a recording of that webinar because it really contains a lot of useful information. And to get a copy of that uh, webinar, you can email us at training at employersgroup.com. A little disclaimer for uh, today's presentation, a determination of the best course of action to take to avoid violations of federal and state employment discrimination laws and regulations involve detailed inquiries beyond the scope of the summaries addressed in this presentation. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as rendering advice in any particular case. That's important for us to always ahead of time in case you have a question that, that comes up that we need to address. Uh, today's webinar, uh, in our promotional materials that we sent out, we did indicate that this is entry-level content. It's very technical, re uh, technical related. Um, the state has made some uh, modifications to the CFRA uh, and made it more in line with FMLA in some respects. So it's very technical in nature. So we did um, ask that some people have prerequisites for the webinar. And this should basically have uh, some uh, foundational knowledge of basic leaves administration, uh, specifically the interplay between FMLA and CFRA, uh, distinctions between the two, and how each relate to the PDL. Um, so it's very difficult for us to be able to identify what the prerequisite is, but we did come up with a very brief survey question that we thought would be helpful um, to pose to all of you to sort of ascertain your knowledge of leaves um, in the context of today's presentation. So what I'd like to do is have Stephen pull that, um, that quiz question up for us, take a moment and answer the question that's on the screen. Which of the following leave laws may concurrently uh, run at the same time? So it's A, FMLA and CFRA, B, FMLA and PDL, C, PDL, or D, A and B only. So we'll give you just a few more seconds to answer that question. OK, go ahead. Uh, Stephen, can you close out the poll? And it'll just take a, a few seconds for it to, to show up. And then can you go ahead and display the results, Stephen? And it takes a little bit for the system to tabulate the results. Well, Stephen's uh, pulling that up. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get the, the poll results. But the answer to that question is D. Um, so most of you answered D. And certainly, if you did not answer D, um, this webinar will be helpful to you. More technical content that uh, might get a little confusing. Uh, one thing that we would recommend, and, and we have created a, a brand new program, um, and it's leaves training. If you are currently an employer's group member, you have access uh, to a basics of leaves of absence course specifically geared toward California employers. It's only about um, an hour and 15 minutes. It's available online and on demand. And simply just go to etrainingportal.com, enter your email address and your member number, and then you can go ahead and enroll yourself in any of the courses that you see there. Um, and the basics of leaves um, is right under the HR category. So you can go ahead and feel free to um, enroll yourself in any of those courses. We have also developed, and, and I want to thank Mark Nelson for doing this, an intermediate leaves of absence course. And it's a three-part uh, program uh, covering family, medical, and pregnancy leaves specifically for California employers. And it includes access to the basics of leaves course. Again, it's available online, on demand. Each of the modules, the four modules that are, are, are part of that program, include a 20-question proficiency exam. Um, and the fees are listed on the, on the sheet. We've also enclosed on the presentation materials right at the end some additional information on that program. 
So certainly, if you do need some additional lease training, uh, we recommend this for any HR person in California because it's so critical to have. Uh, the intermediate uh, lease of absence has a lot of um, hypothetical situations that have, would be very uh, worth your while to go through the program. So as we get into the presentation itself today, I wanted to ask Mark, what does joint employer mean? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, basically, what in joint employer status means is where an employee performs work which simultaneously benefits two or more employers or, or essentially works for two or more employers at different times uh, during a work week, work week, a joint employment relationship may exist. The underlying reason for this is that, of course, if I were to lease all my employees from, uh, from a leasing agency and then sexually harass all of them, um, because if, if there wasn't such thing as a joint employer status, uh, there would be no recourse for those employees to actually affect change in the workplace where the uh, sexual harassment was occurring. So we have this joint employer status uh, to hold employers accountable if they exercise control over individuals who may work for or receive their paycheck from someone else, but were uh, receiving the benefit of their work. Um, uh, additionally, by the way, um, uh, when it comes to stuff like that, uh, when we're thinking about CFRA, joint employer status can also impact things like employee eligibility. And we'll talk about um, what the conditions are, a reminder for everyone, uh, how employees must, how long employees must work, at what locations, et cetera, to qualify for CFRA. But if an individual uh, works for us through a leased agency uh, and then we hire that employee on, this joint employer concept uh, may mean that we have to look all the way back to the point where the employee first started through the leased agency to determine their eligibility and not just the time that we brought them on a as a regular full-time employee. Um, uh, so that's basically the concept. One thing to keep in mind here, uh, specific to CFRA, is that uh, if there are uh, joint employer scenarios at your workplace, the primary employer's office, i.e. the leased, uh, leasing agency, um, uh, would be the um, uh, primary uh, employer, so to speak, until the individual worked at least one year for the secondary employer, at which, at which time uh, the FMLA would switch to the uh, secondary employer. Uh, that, uh, that kind of captures that in a uh, nutshell, so to speak. And certainly, uh, I, I will say, um, uh, if you have follow-up questions uh, for any of these slides and are a member of EG, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, we can talk about it in depth, one-on-one um, uh, uh, -on -one in a helpline call. Great. Thanks, Mark. So this update addresses employee eligibility. As a reminder for our participants, what are some of the requirements for an employee to be eligible to take FMLA um, and CFRA? Absolutely. Um, uh, often it's one of the, the FMLA regulations are enormous um, and the CFRA regulations aren't quite as big, but um, it's easy to forget kind of the basics. So uh, what we'll try and do is take a step back uh, to the extent we can and kind of remind employers about the qualifications. In this case, uh, if an employer works at a, uh, if an employer is subject to the CFRA and FMLA, i.e. they have more than 50 employees, um, uh, then an employee may be eligible if they work uh, 12 months or more for that employer. Um, uh, incidentally, by the way, those 12 months do not need to be continuous. Uh, they could work for us uh, two months, go away, come back, work for us uh, you know, uh, nine months, uh, and then uh, request a month in advance the need for leave. Uh, and we would have to consider those two months that they worked for us previously. Um, additionally, uh, the other requirements are that they work at a site with 50 or more employees within 75 miles. Uh, and then finally, that they work 1,250 hours in the 12 months immediately preceding leave. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, the, 12, the 1,250 hours and the 12 months that they work for us um, uh, are determined at the time the employee is projected to take the leave not the time the employee makes the request. Uh, by contrast, uh, the, the site that they work at, the 50 or more employees within 75 miles, is determined at the time they make their request. So uh, if you're planning a downsizing, you can't then tell the employee, uh, by the time you go out on your leave, we'll be under 50, so you're not eligible. Uh, 
Um, uh, uh, just a, uh, a point with that with regard to the CFRA and the changes that we're looking at, those 12 months that the employee must work for us that don't have to be continuous, um, uh, the FMLA regulations have always said that if an employee um, uh, worked for you a long time ago, we don't have to consider that employment past seven years uh, their previous employment, um, uh, um, uh, in the, and, and the CFRA regulations were always silent on that. Uh, this uh, update uh, that's coming July 1 uh, basically adds the seven-year cutoff language that the FMLA had. Uh, they're very seldom, uh, this, this scenario will probably very seldom come up for you. And of course, remember that employees must meet all three of those requirements, the 12 months, 1,250 hours, and the 50 employees within 75 miles. Um, uh, such that um, uh, they would still have to meet the 1,250 hours in the 12 months before they take their leave anyway. So um, uh, that may uh, alter a lot of uh, scenarios for employees uh, requesting leave as well. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so with Article 11 with no fixed work site, I'm assuming that this slide still addresses employee eligibility, namely that the employee works work at the site with 50 or more employees within 75 miles. Right, exactly. You're absolutely right. And Jeff, uh, so yeah, continuing on with that requirement that in, you know, those three requirements, one of them being 50 or more employees within 75 miles, uh, the FMLA regulations contemplated uh, the coming trend of telework um, uh, and wanted to capture those individuals. Uh, so if I work remotely in Montana for an employer with 300 employees at their headquarters in Los Angeles, uh, if I report to or if I receive assignments from Los Angeles, where there are more than 50 employees, I am eligible for FMLA. Uh, the regulations, the FMLA regulations were always very clear on that. The CFRA regulations were not. Uh, so these new changes, the new regulatory uh, changes, uh, add the same language. Obviously, when we're talking about a scenario like this, you're generally thinking telecommuters. Uh, in some cases, those of you in construction, your construction workers who don't work out of any particular site, uh, but report and receive assignments from headquarters. Great, thanks, Mark. And it's important to note, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but all of these new sort of changes with CFRA go into effect on uh, July 1st. So they're not currently in act, but certainly we wanted to give this information to you before they go into action. And regarding length of service, uh, dealing with employee eligibility to take FMLA, this again goes toward the requirement you mentioned that employee work 12 months, correct? Right, exactly. It clarifies that if an employee meets a 12-month service requirement, um, uh, they don't actually have to be working uh, during that time. Uh, in other words, um, employees who may require a medical leave of absence as a disability accommodation prior to becoming eligible for the FMLA, like 10 months in, uh, they go to their doctor, we find out that they have a disability that requires leave as a reasonable accommodation. If they cross over that um, uh, threshold of 12 months while they're out on an unpaid leave of absence, we now trigger FMLA and CFRA. Um, uh, you know, the C FMLA regs don't specifically address this, but it's always been a best practice uh, to consider that um, uh, the case. And certainly with the CFRA regulatory changes here, um, our, our advice is uh, to, you know, when they meet that 12-month requirement, uh, trigger their FMLA CFRA immediately. I know with uh, key employees, it's always been a headache for employers and certainly denying it can be somewhat of a minefield as well. What do these revisions have to do with uh, to burden either of these? Yeah, it's great um, uh, that you bring that up because uh, our recommendation is always consult your legal counsel um, uh, for a key employee designation. Basically, um, uh, the FMLA uh, has always had this notion of a key employee um, uh, and defined it to be an employee uh, who is paid on a salary basis and is among the highest 10% of the employer's employees at that location within 75 miles um, uh, uh, at the time the leave is requested. Um, uh, the problem uh, with the uh, uh, key employee designation and what the CFRA uh, did not have but now includes is that that's not where the designation ends. Uh, in other words, just because I meet those qualifications does not mean I can deny leave 
to those um, uh, to those individuals. Um, uh, you must have their absence, I should say, um, uh, must cause grievous, substantial, and grievous economic injury. Uh, uh, to the employer's operations, and that's an extremely high threshold uh, for employers to establish um, uh, before they exercise the right to deny a key employee the leave. In, in effect, really what you're, not doing, you're doing is you're not necessarily denying the employee the leave, you're just saying we won't reinstate you afterwards or we may, may not exercise the right to reinstate you afterwards. Incidentally, if you do use a key employee and you get your attorney to sign off on it, that it will cause substantial and grievous economic injury, um, you need to tell your employee before they go out, not after they've been out for a while and now want to come back. So this is, a, this is an analysis that's done before the employee ever goes out. Um, uh, and basically, again, uh, like many of the regulations that we'll be talking about today and that uh, Jeff alluded to earlier, uh, it's basically cleanup. Um, what a lot of uh, these regulations do is cross-reference the FMLA regulations for clarity. Um, uh, I should add here, uh, as a quick aside, the CFRA regulations um, do have a provision that say they, to the extent that it's consistent with California law, um, uh, the F the FMLA regulations uh, will be incorporated into the CFRA regulations. They always referenced uh, the original FMLA regulations that were passed in 1995, but they've now uh, clarified that they're incorporating by reference the FMLA regulations that were passed back in 2013. So um, uh, that being said, um, because the uh, CFRA regulations always traditionally gave a hat tip to the FMLA regulations where the CFRA regulations were silent, um, because that language that it had to still be consistent with CFR or with California law meant a lot of employers were saying, well, would the, the California courts agree that this was consistent with California law following this federal FMLA regulation? We don't know. And so uh, the DFE fi DFEH finally stepped in and said, we'll clarify. We understand that there were some points of concern. We'll clarify and let you know where we agree uh, that um, uh, following the FMLA regulations is, is right on par. And so that's why we have today's discussion in large part uh, is so that uh, we have better guidance uh, from the state when it comes to administering the CFRA leaves for our employees and how much we can incorporate by way of the FMLA regulations, uh, even you know, with that FMLA hat tip in the CFRA regulations themselves. Great, thanks, Mark. That's, that's some really good advice. Uh, so we're moving on from the regulations that address which employees are eligible to take FMLA and moving on to discuss the events that trigger the FMLA leave. Um, this slide here on substance abuse um, may be a serious health condition under the FMLA, but it was previously unclear under the CFRA. Um, this looks like a little cleanup to me aligning uh, the FMLA regulations with CFRA. Is that all that's happening right now? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jeff. There's not a lot to add here other than that they include treatment for substance abuse uh, uh, does fall under a serious health condition, uh, whether it be for inpatient care or continuing treatment. Uh, not a lot uh, extra to add to that. Uh, and I would imagine as a best practice, you're already practicing this anyway. So uh, I won't add too much to that. And for inpatient care, maybe remind our um, participants how FMLA defines a serious health condition. Yeah, um, basically uh, a serious health condition uh, can be either inpatient care or uh, uh, three or more consecutive days absence followed by ongoing treatment in both cases. Um, uh, the question uh, arose, though, is what constitutes inpatient care and the extent to which an employee needs to be admitted in the hospital to qualify for inpatient care. Um, and this um, uh, slide clears up uh, some um, uh, prior uh, confusion regarding whether or not the if the employee was uh, admitted with an intent to keep them overnight but then released without uh, overnight stay. Um, uh, that overnight stay, uh, because uh, overnight stay is part of the definition of inpatient care, uh, whether or not uh, that meant that this was no longer a serious health condition. And the regulations now clarify that um, even though um, uh, an employee must be admitted overnight, uh, if they are, uh, the, the, the 
status of being admitted overnight is just at the time they are admitted, is there an intent to keep them overnight? And then if we subsequently release them without an overnight stay, uh, it doesn't matter. They are still, uh, they still meet the definition of a serious health condition. It's a little bit of a um, particular, I mean, you won't have many scenarios like this, um, but uh, in the event um, uh, that, that the language clarifies, I should say. <laughs> well, at least we covered it, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so regarding um, incapacity, how does that relate to a serious health condition? Um, uh, incapacity is also used to define a serious health condition. Um, uh, here, it's just some uh, um, uh, cleanup again. Uh, we borrow from the FMLA regulations, uh, and, and you'll see here in the slide it says it's an inability to work, attend school, or perform other daily uh, activities due to the serious health condition, its treatment, or the recovery that it requires. So basically, um, uh, not a lot uh, to add there. Um, but um, a lot of cleanup regarding um, uh, uh, squaring away uh, FMLA and CFRA regulations. Okay, those basically covered, you know, the cleanup with uh, the, the conditions. Uh, so we're moving away from that, and now we're going to move into the conditions um, when employees return from a leave. Uh, what do the regulations say, and does it even modify anything for the employee, employers? Yeah, um, uh, the, uh, both laws entitle the employee to reinstatement, um, uh, so it's not um, uh, um, uh, a big deal here. Uh, and your best practices probably already incorporate the FMLA language uh, anyway. Um, uh, uh, but the CFRA regulations now clarify that uh, in scenarios like where an employee is no longer qualified because of an inability to attend training, uh, we must give them reasonable opportunities to fulfill the conditions upon return. We first saw this language in the USERA regulations of all, of all things, and then um, uh, it kind of merged its way through. And so now uh, in scenarios where employees miss out because of their FMLA, and in this case now CFRA, uh, leave of absence, we want to pr try and move them uh, back up to speed as quickly as possible. Um, uh, uh, please note also that employees are entitled to reinstatement even if their position was replaced temporarily. Um, you know, in other words, we can't say we like the employee, um, and this happens all the time. If I've talked to one, I've talked to 100 uh, HR professionals who have managers complaining that the person who filled in for the employee on CFRA leave um, uh, is doing a better job and they want to leave that employee in that job. Uh, our recommendation is, n has always been uh, put the employee who was on leave back in that position. Um, uh, um, uh, and, and also, by the way, if you have to move people around and restructure temporarily uh, because of the employee's absence, once the employee returns, you need to put them back in play as well. Uh, always, 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 um, uh, when you put an employee employee in a position, notify the employee who's filling in uh, that they're temporarily replacing the employee so that there's no expectation either from the employee who's filling in or uh, any uh, uh, hardship when the employee returns from leave uh, and uh, we're having difficulty getting the employee out of that job to put the uh, employee returning from leave back in their job. And I would say, um for the rates upon return, it's pretty much the same thing goes for this regulation as well? Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, uh, benefits resumed in the same manner at all levels. Um, uh, you may uh, accommodate an employee's request to transfer to, to, uh, to a position that better suits the employee. Obviously, our best uh, practice here is get that um, in writing from the employee in case they later change their mind and want the old position back uh, and then say, no, 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 you guys forced me into this new job. I didn't want it. Uh, so obviously, uh, in these situations, if you do accommodate an employee, make sure that employee makes the request in writing so you've got it. And for permissible defenses, I would assume the same thing. Does this modify anything? Yeah, basically, um, uh, there are three permissible defenses that the CFRA regs talk about. One of them we've already addressed, which was the key employee um, uh, uh, scenario. Uh, they also talk about um, uh, what happens if the position went away while the employee was out. Um, and in those situations, obviously, an employee enjoys no greater protection uh, from leave than they would have had where they've been continuously working. And if you lay off an entire department, uh, including uh, the employee uh, who was in that department but out on leave, 
that employee can't shield themselves from the layoff simply because they were on leave. Uh, and this basically uh, addresses that. Uh, prior, uh, prior to this, the CFRA regulations were silent, but now uh, incorporates uh, the FMLA language. The other permissible defense, which we'll talk about next, is, is employees who took leave fraudulently. And certainly that, that's a big item that, that's coming up for employers. So what would you add to this slide about employees who obtain FMLA fraudulently? fraudulently? Um, uh, employees who take it fraudulently, this is one of those situations where proving fraud is very uh, difficult. Um, uh, absent an admission from the employee, you want to have some burnt smoking guns um, uh, to really uh, execute on this. It can't be an assumption um, uh, uh, that um, uh, your manager uh, has based on uh, what uh, three employees may or may not have uh, said and the manager overheard in a, uh, you know, a break uh, or something. Uh, you really want some tangible proof there. Uh, our recommendation, again, uh, going back to these standards that are very high for the employer to meet, uh, you may want to circle back with your legal counsel just to make sure you have sufficient information to support that, uh, absent something like an admission that the employee uh, took it fraudulently. Uh, but basically, um, uh, uh, it's essentially that um, uh, same same burden of proof problem. Okay, thank you. And regarding right. the 12-month period, uh, before we drive into this regu the regulatory change here, why don't you give our participants some context regarding how you calculate the 12 weeks of leave that employers, empl I'm sorry, employees are entitled to in a 12-month period? Absolutely. The FMLA regulations detail four. Um, there are four ways an employer may elect to calculate the 12 weeks in which an employee gets the 12 months um, uh, and how those 12 months will be calculated. Essentially, you can use a calendar year. Um, uh, that's your first option. Uh, uh, alternatively, uh, your second option could be any fixed 12-month um, uh, period of time like uh, the anniversary year of the employee, the fiscal year, anything that's set in stone. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, you may um, uh, set it as the 12 month period measured forward from the date employee first takes CFRA or FMLA leave. Um, uh, so in other words, uh, when the employee first goes out, we set in stone that time frame and look uh, exactly 12 months in the future uh, and um, uh, uh, that becomes the end date uh, for that third calculation. Incidentally, if you use, if you, if, if you have employees under FMLA only, there's no CFRA for this, but uh, if employees a, a, are required to be out to care for an injured service member, uh, regardless of how the company calculates the, their, uh, you know, has elected to calculate one of the four ways, you must follow that uh, third um, fixed in time from the date the employee first goes out. Uh, that's the only leave that employees take where the regulations actually dictate how you calculate that 12 weeks. Injured service member leave under FMLA only. Uh, otherwise, in all cases, the employer can uh, establish the 12-month uh, period as they choose. And then the final is a rolling 12-month period measured back exactly one year every day. Um, uh, it, so it's always moving forward. That window going back a year is always moving forward every day. Uh, that the calendar progresses another day. So uh, those are the four ways you can do it. Um, and traditionally, uh, the CFRA regulations have been silent on this, but employers have always been following those four uh, um, uh, calculations uh, or options. Uh, incidentally, by the way, um, uh, the new language uh, not only just adds those uh, four uh, calculation methods, but also uh, clarifies the FMLA language uh, that also exists that if you do not designate in writing uh, for your employees the method that the company will use to calculate the 12 months in a 12 weeks in a 12 month period, the employee is entitled to elect the one most favorable for them. Uh, so if you've got employees family planning at the end of a year, um, uh, you know, theoretically, you could be looking at employees going out in October, uh, coming back in December, leaving again in January, and going back out till March because you didn't clarify uh, in writing what your uh, calculation would be. Important, important to consider. That's a very important consideration and a good reminder to those employers that don't have that um, in writing. Uh, so that's something that they should get on top of right away if they don't. Um, 
Regarding reasonable efforts, I would imagine this slide is some relief for employers that are concerned about managing uh, inter intermittent leaves of the employees. It is. It is. Um, it's one of those things where on paper it looks really good um, uh, that employees must exercise reasonable efforts, um, and you can hold employees to that standard, but um, when employees challenge you on that, it becomes administratively uh, and practically uh, a little bit more difficult for you to enforce. Uh, in other words, um, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to look like you're uh, retaliating against employees for exercising their rights under FMLA, CFRA, uh, to, to take their intermittent leave. So uh, you kind of are dancing um, uh, a little bit there, uh, doing a little bit of a tap dance to make sure that the uh, 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 we're, we're not crossing over that line and looking like we're retaliating against employees for actually asking them to exercise more reasonableness. Um, so to speak, uh, in scheduling their absences. But but it's good that that exists. Great. Uh, then regarding overtime, I'm guessing this uh, clarification doesn't affect many of our participants today, does it? You're right. Unless you have mandatory overtime that you frequently require employees to work, um, uh, the FMLA regulations um, uh, clarify that if they're required to work mandatory overtime, you can count that mandatory overtime against their 12 weeks. Um, uh, of leave time or, or equivalent if they're on intermittent leave and we basically, as you guys know, when an employee goes on an intermittent leave, we calculate the number of hours that they normally work in a week and deduct from uh, those hours, well, take the hours that they work in a week times 12 and then deduct from that total calculation of the hours they work times 12 minus um, uh, the hours that they take here and there for their intermittent leave. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, the CFRA regulations clarified that if employees uh, take uh, or cannot work mandatory overtime, um, uh, we can count that against uh, their CFRA, uh, where we've always been able to count it against their FMLA. And then uh, regarding schedule changes, why don't you give our participants some context on what exactly this slide means for them? Um, uh, this is basically where there are permanent or long-term schedule changes. Um, uh, employers should use the new schedule for the leave. Uh, the FMLA regulations have always said this. The CFR regulations were um, uh, silent on this, however. So uh, if you basically uh, have made a permanent or long-term schedule change, that schedule change will dictate the leave that the employee takes uh, for purposes of calculating the hours the employee is eligible to take, um, uh, uh, you know, intermittent leave scenarios, uh, or uh, um, uh, you know, if they're missing time uh, continuously, it's not that big of a difference, but that's basically what we're talking about there. Okay, so we're, we're back to the dreaded issue of uh, intermittent leaves under FMLA. What does this regulation say about how you track? Yeah, basically, um, this, and, and again, this, this policy does not, will not affect many of you. Um, uh, unless you are in the airline industry uh, 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 um, moving, um, uh, if, if, if you're in transportation, that kind of a thing where once an employee is on the plane, uh, we can't tell them they can't work more than four hours, they're stuck on the plane. Um, so it, where it becomes impossible for you uh, to grant the intermittent leave, then uh, and only then can you count the entire time the employee um, uh, misses, uh, say in the example of a flight attendant, their flight um, because of the intermittent leave, we count the entire flight against their leave entitlement. Uh, the CFRA regulations um, uh, have been silent about this, but there, it's always been in the FMLA regulations, and basically it adds the same CFRA regulations. Um, you must return the employee to work if they're able to uh, perform other aspects uh, of their work that are not physically impossible, uh, i.e. the administrative duties, that kind of a thing. Uh, don't let this, don't misinterpret this slide to mean if I don't have work um, uh, for the employee that I can transfer, you know, with employees on intermittent leave, if their intermittent leave um, uh, creates a hardship uh, in the position that they normally work, you can temporarily transfer them to another position that better accommodates uh, the leave. Um, but our, our, our philosophy on this is um, if there are no positions that you can transfer the employee to before you put the employee out continuously on leave, um, because we can't accommodate their, uh, you know, there's nothing to transfer the employee to, circle back with your legal counsel 
there is always work to be performed if you're more than 50 employees uh, is kind of the thinking on that. So um, make sure your attorney signs off on the fact that an employee uh, who only needs to be gone on intermittent leave uh, wants to be, or the employer wants to pace, place the employee out on leave continuously uh, because the intermittent leave, we can't find any intermittent leave sufficient for the employee to do. Uh, those scenarios, talk to your legal counsel before you uh, tell the employee uh, we don't have any intermittent leave for you. Okay, I, I don't think we have any airlines as participants today, but certainly that could be a really good HR trivia question to ask some other people. There you go. <laughs> that might be some useful Great. information for some, some people on the phone. I like uh, it. So oh. going on, <laughs> I'm guessing employers will be glad to see this regulation clarified regarding salary basis. Uh, can you elaborate more on, on yeah. this? Yeah, uh, the F FMLA? Absolutely. The FMLA um, uh, regulations uh, have indicated that there is no um, uh, problem uh, with the Fair Labor Standards Act's salary basis rules, meaning uh, as, as, as uh, those of you in wage and hour know this, um, uh, you know, you can, you, if an exempt employee works any portion of the work week, they trigger their full weekly salary obligation. Uh, we can carve out of that uh, full uh, weekly salary in uh, full day increments when permitted under the salary basis regulations, never less than full day increments, however. Um, uh, of course, that runs afoul of an employee who needs to work half days for you on intermittent leave under the FMLA. How do I handle that? Do I have to pay them their full salary? Well, the FMLA regulations said we, don't, uh, we won't take issue with uh, carving out that time missed on intermittent leave on an hourly basis, um, even if it means paying the employee a partial day. Um, uh, that has been in the FMLA regulations. The problem is uh, it was the CFRA reg regulations were silent, and as we know, uh, the CFRA, or the CFRA, California does not always follow uh, the federal salary basis regulation. So there was a giant question mark as to whether or not this could be done in California. Um, uh, uh, these regulations clearly specify, and I'm reading um, uh, from the regulations directly now, uh, quote, employers may reduce exempt employees' pay for CFRA intermittent leave or reduced work schedule, provided the reduction is not inconsistent with any applicable collective bargaining agreement or employer leave policy, the FEHA, uh, and any other applicable state or federal law. Uh, so that seems to be providing us that uh, freedom. If you are a zero risk tolerant company, still <laughs> check in with your legal counsel on this topic um, next time you speak with them, uh, just to make sure that, that there's not a hidden uh, gem in there for us. But um, uh, it seems to be providing us a lot more flexibility uh, than we previously uh, uh, believed. Okay, thanks, Mark. Regarding verbal notice, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I, I think this slide may not be welcome news for um, employers. Right, exactly. Um, uh, uh, this is one of those things where um, uh, who has to um, uh, declare CFRA leave? Um, uh, uh, there's always been kind of the onus on the employer to being ultimately responsible to inquire to know, um, uh, and this kind of solidifies that idea. So if an employee uh, basically tells you they need um, uh, leave, um, uh, if they specifically say, I need my CFRA leave, obviously that's understood, uh, and we respond by triggering uh, their FMLA CFRA leave. Uh, if the employee, however, may say, I need a leave of absence for um, uh, family reasons, then we have a duty to inquire further to find out if it's an FMLA qualifying. Um, uh, this clarifies that even if the underlying reason is known uh, to be CFRA qualifying and the employee instead says, well, I, I want to take uh, uh, leave to care for my family, but I want to use my vacation or sick leave, because we know the underlying reason is to take care of family members, we cannot absolve ourselves of responsibility simply because the employee elected to use vacation or sick leave uh, in lieu of um, uh, uh, clearly designating it as CFRA or FMLA qualifying. Uh, basically, just in, always, always, uh, when in doubt, inquire further. Never, of course, never violate the employee's um, uh, medical privacy or anything along those, or their family members' medical privacy, but uh, certainly the extent to which we can gain enough information to determine whether or not it's CFRA qualifying, uh, we want to go that route. Great. 
Uh, thanks, Mark. Regarding uh, retroactive uh, designation, before we address this slide, uh, Mark, why don't we give them a little context regarding the, the designation of FMLA, FMLA leave. In other words, leave that is not addressed within the five-day window that uh, employers are supposed to start that ball rolling after learning enough uh, to extend employees to require notices. Yeah, yeah, good one. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the history here gives you a better understanding of this. Um, uh, you know, prior to the changes in 2009, uh, uh, retroactive designation uh, was flat out prohibited. Uh, if the employer missed the window uh, to designate, um, uh, then they could not retroactively designate under the old regulations. Employers challenged that notion, uh, and uh, the courts agreed. And so the Department of Labor revised their regulation to say that um, uh, retroactive designation would be permitted, but not if it hurt the employee, um, uh, i.e. caused them harm or injury. Uh, the problem that those regulations um, uh, uh, created is that what does it mean to harm or injure an employee? Um, uh, uh, so we, we, we kind of ha have the same language now rolled into the CFRA regulations, uh, uh, indicating that, of course, retroactive designation um, uh, is only permissible if it does not cause in, in harm or injury. Um, uh, the FMLA regulations um, did kind of provide a workaround for this, that if the employer and the employee agreed, um, uh, mutually agreed to retroactive designation, uh, then that would be permitted in all cases. Uh, the problem, though, is that the CFR regulations in adding this language did not add the notion of a mutual agreement. So there is a gray area here. Um, I would add this to the list of questions I would want to ask my legal counsel next time I spoke with them. Not, not, I probably wouldn't call unless this issue were um, uh, current with an employee requesting leave right now, um, but you might want to take guidance um, regarding this retroactive designation and what it means to cause harm or injury. Uh, take that up with your legal counsel before ever trying to retroactively designate. Regarding medical certification, I know it could be uh, tricky contacting a healthcare provider and that, let's say, that the, super, uh, the employee supervisor is never permitted to contact the healthcare provider for any reason. What does it say about HR contacting the healthcare provider? It's a great point to bring up, and uh, uh, thank you, by the way, Jeff, for mentioning supervisors and the employee's immediate supervisor is never permitted uh, to contact uh, the medical or healthcare provider. Um, uh, in this particular instance, the FMLA regulations say that you can uh, you can contact for clarification and to authenticate. Um, uh, like if you clarify language that we couldn't understand, something along those lines. The new changes only address clarification. Uh, excuse me, uh, authentication, not clarification. Um, uh, and it looks like clarification language was, mo was removed from earlier drafts. Uh, of this um, uh, regulation. So they're clearly making a point that they only want you to call for authentication, not for clarification. And regarding to uh, return to work uh, releases, uh, this slide has to be good news for employers concerning um, the safety of their employees. Right, yeah, it adds that, uh, you know, obviously when employees are out on, say, intermittent leave, we cannot request to leave every time they're gone, or, or return to work release every time they're uh, returning from an intermittent leave. Um, however, if there are safety concerns, uh, the CFRA regulations build in that um, uh, we can request one every 30 days. Um, and then, of course, requiring the return to work release uh, if they're out um, uh, continuously. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so this, this does um, provide a little relief for employers. But remember, every time uh, you request one of those return to work releases, we, we tend to deem that to be a recertification and there are severe limitations on when you can request recertifications. Um, uh, but this uh, does uh, provide that out for uh, safety sensitive situations. And regarding untimely return, uh, before you address any changes with this, why don't you remind us what the time frames are for employers providing notices and employees returning medical certifications uh, make mandatory by the employer? Yeah, yeah. you know, um, you're not required um, uh, under the FMLA or CFRA regulations uh, to have a certification on file uh, for employees requesting medical leave or family leave to care for the serious health condition of a family member, um, but you may require it. Uh, and if you do require it, 
uh, then the employee must return it within 15 days um, uh, of um, uh, the, the medical uh, certification or healthcare provider certification uh, issued, uh, being issued the employee. Um, but there is language on the end of that in the, in the FMLA regulations and now um, on the CFRA regulations that address um, if it is not practicable under the circumstances uh, to get the, the certification returned despite the employee's diligent good faith efforts, um, uh, then uh, the employee has that additional time until they are able, despite, uh, you know, with their good faith efforts, uh, to have that medical certification returned. Same thing goes uh, um, uh, in the CFR regulations. If there are extenuating circumstances, then we have to give them additional time. Our recommendation is always, if they don't return it uh, within 15 days, send them a notice. Um, if they still haven't returned it within seven days after that, send them another notice saying, you know, you're at risk of us not uh, counting this time as FMLA. Uh, and tell them unless you're able to get us this return, uh, please have this return uh, to us immediately. Uh, and then again, if uh, seven days later they don't have it, uh, send them yet another notice. But, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this kind of gives you a little bit more permission under the CFR regulations to do that. So notice, notice, notice. Right, uh -huh. exactly. Well done. Uh, for, <laughs> with paid leave, I know you said this before with the FMLA, um, that it's often misunderstood or ignored by employers. Why don't you give us some context here? Yeah, this is really important. If there's anything you listen to in this lecture, or lecture, um, uh, in this update that we're giving you today, uh, pay attention to this slide. Uh, I talked to more HR professionals who were not aware that this regulation changed. The FMLA regulations used to say that the employer could force the employee to exhaust all available leave banks, vacation, sick leave, at the beginning of their leave. Um, uh, well, there was a case involving an employee, I think it was Illinois, I can't remember for sure, um, uh, and the employee was forced to do as much, um, and she was not uh, being able to, she was not eligible to draw from her short-term disability benefit uh, to which uh, her employer had uh, provided her because it would have been a windfall to the employee. Um, the company was compensating her for leave with available leave banks. Um, she sued, the court agreed, uh, and uh, the FMLA regulations were revised to state that you can force an employee to use available leave banks if there is no disability benefit plan in place, meaning if the employee is not eligible for state disability insurance uh, or paid family leave or workers' comp, uh, if they're getting a workers' comp benefit or some private short-term disability benefit, uh, any, any of those things qualify under a disability benefit plan. Um, you cannot force the use of available vacation while that's in play. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, uh, a lot of employers still have the old language in even their employee handbooks. Uh, if you have that, update it, um, uh, take that language out uh, and add that disability benefit plan stuff in there. Um, but uh, the CFRA regulations now uh, kind of are brought in line uh, with that change as well. So uh, any form of disability payments that the employee may be receiving, do not force them to use uh, available paid leave bank. Okay, that's such an important aspect, so if there's anything you take away from today's webinar, please be sure to pay attention to slide 28, so maybe mark that down so that you can go back and check everything. Um, going on to health benefits, um, there's probably nothing really new here, it's probably just a cleanup, right Mark? Yeah, it's basically just cleanup. Um, uh, uh, FMLA requires maintenance of group health benefits for the entire duration. Um, uh, the PDL uh, was amended to do the same. Uh, and there was some tricky language that the CFRA regulations had in place that said um, the healthcare obligation under CFRA were run with FMLA, but of course, with FMLA and PDO running together, uh, that created some issues. So um, this, um, they they revised the PDL regulations to state that um, uh, uh, the CFRA uh, group health benefit. Um, uh, healthcare continuation benefit uh, is a separate right to the PDL benefit. What that crazy convoluted analysis basically means to employers is the entire duration the employee is out on FMLA, PDL, or and or 
CFRA continue their group health for the duration of those three benefits. Um, uh, or seek legal counsel if you uh, disagree. Um, uh, make sure that your counsel supports your decision. But basically, uh, what this means for health con healthcare continuation is that the employee is entitled uh, to pay their portion, or as, as long as they're paying their portion of the healthcare, uh, healthcare benefit, their copay, uh, we keep them on the benefit plan the entire duration of their leave. And this next one for payment of premiums, I have to say every year in the fall during our workplace and employment law update, a question on this always comes up. So this clarification has to be helpful for employers who have always wondered if this is permissible in California. You're right. You're right. Um, the FMLA regulations basically have a provision that says uh, if an employee who's out on leave of absence is, and, and, and obviously isn't paying their portion of the copay because they're on an unpaid leave uh, under FMLA unless you provide paid leave, uh, to your employees and we deduct accordingly. Uh, if they're on unpaid leave and they're not paying their copay, if they're more than 30 days late and the employer provides written notice um, uh, that gives them at least 15 days to cure, uh, then uh, the employer may end their um, payment. Uh, uh, incidentally, by the way, that's not a COBRA qualifying event. You know, there's those, what, three occasions um, uh, where employees can lose coverage and it's not COBRA qualifying. This is one of those. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the problem, though, was that the CFRA regulations were silent on this, and uh, obviously the implications of dropping someone from coverage are pretty severe. Our advice has always been uh, consult legal um, before you try and incorporate those federal FMLA regulations into CFRA if CFRA is running concurrently with the FMLA as it usually does, um, uh, this actually incorporates the FMLA procedures. Great, thanks, Mark. And, and as we move on to sort of the final slide in today's uh, presentation before we, we do some uh, conclusions, this, um, this one on benefit changes sounds like it might be an important, important for employers to roll into their policies and procedures. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, you know, internally, uh, especially your benefits uh, administrators, uh, you will want to make sure that uh, if benefits change while the employees on FMLA, uh, that you uh, implement this procedure that you will notify those employees on, uh, F uh, on CFRA uh, that they um, uh, will be provided written notice of the changes impacting the employees. So that's pretty much it. That's, uh, in a nutshell, uh, as you probably suspect, especially if you're familiar with extensively um, uh, leaves administration in California, not a lot of, well, there aren't substantive changes because these are just regulatory. They don't change the law, um, but they provide some additional clarity for administration uh, and uh, are generally helpful. So uh, this is one where um, uh, the DFEH, um, by providing that clarity for employers, uh, has really kind of done us a solid in this. Well, they did some spring cleaning just in time for your summer vacation, so I, I, I guess that could be a good thing for this for the state. Um, I do want to remind everybody, I, I did put uh, Mark's email address on the screen, so if you do have any questions that, that were not able to be answered during today's presentation, um, he's said that you can go ahead and email him and he can get back to you with uh, responses to your questions. I want to thank everyone for your time during today's presentation. Uh, we look forward to serving you in the future regarding any HR-related questions that you have. Thank you for your time today and have a great weekend.